Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started with today's show, please hit the subscribe button. It helps us out a lot, and you'll stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. So we've all grown up being told that fluoride is good for our teeth. In fact, the government thought it was so good for the health of our teeth that in the 1940s, they decided to start adding a synthetic chemical fluoride compound to the U.S. water supply, and that practice continues to this day in most of our country. But despite over 73% of the U.S. population being in a fluorinated community water system, tooth decay remains the most prevalent chronic disease in both children and adults, even though it's largely preventable. Now, this has been a highly controversial topic between experts since the 1940s when this program began, and that continues to this day. And many of the doctors who spoke out against the fluoridation of our public water system were called quacks and shunned, which sounds quite familiar to more recent events. Now, more recently in 2017, a coalition including the Fluoride Action Network and the Food and Water Watch and several mothers filed a landmark lawsuit against the EPA, asking them to protect the public and susceptible subpopulations from the neurotoxic risks of fluoride by banning the addition of fluoridination chemicals to the U.S. water supply. Now, this lawsuit is still ongoing due to many delays from the EPA, and the case recently revealed that there were government attempts to limit available evidence and avoid having the facts of water fluoridation reviewed in court. That report is now public due to a judge's order. So today on Discovering True Health, I have two women who are involved in the ongoing battle against the EPA, and we'll be discussing details of a lawsuit, and they'll be sharing with us some of the history of fluoride, what it is, some of the landmark studies, and what we can all do to limit fluoride in our daily lives. So my guest joining me today is Brenda Stoudemire and Karen Spencer. Brenda is a named plaintiff in the ongoing lawsuit against the EPA, and Karen is a member representative for the Food and Water Watch, and is mentioned in the initial filing. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. It's such an important topic. Well, thank you for yeah. having us. For having us. <laughs> Now, Brenda, you're a named plaintiff in the suit against the APA. What was the catalyst for you to become involved in the suit? And when did you become aware of the harmful effects of fluoride? I had a bunch of my own health issues with asthma and allergies. And I kept telling my doctors, I'm going to cure this stuff. And I went and started researching, you know, on the internet, just through Google. And I kept finding all these books on how to make your asthma better with hydration and stuff. And a reoccurring theme was to avoid fluoride. And then my friend Frankie Olvera was dying of bone cancer. And there was a study that came out of Harvard by Basson that was being, um, people were talking a lot about it, if it was a valid study or not. It was very controversial. And my son Hayden, who is also a plaintiff, he was in that age range of susceptibility around the age of seven at that time. So it was just, it resonated with me because it was, so, I was getting it from so many different places to avoid fluoride. I went to PubMed and I started, you know, researching on PubMed. It's kind of like a Google bar, but it's just PubMed for those who don't know it. It's a government website where they archive all of the journal publications for science. And I kept finding all these studies showing that fluoride was harmful. And I thought, you know, this should be really easy to get over water. Maybe somebody just didn't look at the studies yet. So I, I took a bunch of them and I started bringing them forward to the water board and my water utility. And whenever I brought them forward, I was met by all of these uh, dental interests and children's health people and health departments. And I didn't know why they even knew I was going to be there. But then every study was the same story. It was a poorly conducted study. It was comparing apples to oranges. It doesn't apply to us here in America. If it was done in another country, yada, 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 you know that story. And so I noticed that a lot of the kids at my son's school had dental fluorosis. And so I was talking with my one of before he was my attorney about this. And 
we were trying to figure out litigation for the dental fluorosis and we were collecting a lot of people. So this might come forward in the future, but the issue of neurotoxicity seemed easy. There was so many studies there. We submitted, I think over 180 studies demonstrating fluorides neurotoxic to the brain when we petitioned EPA back in 2017. Um, so that's kind of how I first got involved in all this. Interesting. Myself. And have you been called an, an anti, what are they calling you? Anti-fluoride activist. I've been seeing these, the, the pro-fluoride dent, a lot of them are dentists from what I've seen or government agencies. They're kind of, t- which is interesting because that kind of corresponds with some things that are happening today with other health issues. <laughs> um, and the other thing for listeners, you mentioned this kind of came up in your what you, you were describing. A lot of countries don't fluorinate their water. I think there's at least over 22 countries that do not fluorinate from what I've... I, I believe there's less than 10 countries in the whole world that fluoridate 50% of their population or more. So wow. it's it's not that many. So it's not and many that actually fluoridate. There's, there's 10 or less. That fluoridate over 50% of their population. Got it. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely something that we all need to look into. And Karen, you're also a listed member, like we said, for the Food and Water Watch, and you've personally experienced health issues as well and adverse mm-hmm. effects from fluoridation. Can you share with us your story and how you became involved in this suit as well? Yes. Well, my story really starts before the internet, back in 1981. I was pregnant with my second child, and um, we were, I'd been working in June, and then I quit my job, and we were planning a holiday for July 4th weekend, and all of a sudden, I was so sick, and I didn't think I was going to be able to go, but my husband said, oh, we got to go. We drop off our oldest child, and so we went, and I was just so sick, and I just wasn't getting better. Now, for a pregnant woman to all of a sudden be having stomach problems, you know, not so unusual, so you figured just go through it. And I asked the doctor, well, my first pregnancy wasn't like this. And I said, well, pregnancies are all different. But after I delivered, I did not get better. And as a matter of fact, both of my children had the same rashes and stomach, stomach problems like I did. And it was just going on and on and on. So I got very, very careful with my diet and everything. And I remember one day, I say, okay, it's going to make a nice organic vegetable soup. There's not going to be anything in this that's going to bother me. And I had my soup, and afterwards I sat down, and I was sick. I had all my symptoms, all my problems. I said, what, what could be doing it? And I said, oh, my God, it's the water. It's the water. Um, so I went into my GP with baby in the arms and a toddler in tow, and he, he's, I'm trying to tell him my symptoms. At this point, I'd lost so much weight. I was down to 90 pounds. I was terrified. And I was trying to say, you know, doctor, are these hives, they keep breaking out on my body. And he said, no, no, no. And he wouldn't even look at them. They're just bruises. They're just bruises. I pull open my shirt and I said, I think I'd notice if I got bumped here to get a bruise. No, no, no. He wouldn't look at him. It's just bruises. It's just bruises. I finally say to him, could it be something in the water making us sick? He blew up. He said, who put you up to this? Who sent you here? Turns out he was the head, the chairman of the Board of Health who ordered the fluoride into the water back on July 1st of the previous year. I can date when I got sick because you know when you're pregnant, you know when you give birth, you know when you're planning your holiday. Yeah. But Even then, I went to a special allergist, and this is before the internet. He said, well, you know, when they put the fluoride in the water, they put all these other chemicals in it, too, to buffer it. So it could be any of the chemicals. You know, people change. And he gave me the bum's rush out of the door. Well, both of those doctors knew that what I was showing them was a very distinctive type of hive called Chisola maculae that some women and children get in the early stages of fluoride poisoning. And they didn't want to, didn't want to, didn't want to recognize it because they would have to admit that they did something that was wrong. But this is before the internet. 
Nice. I got bottled water for a bunch of years and I did much better. And then I switched to a filter, which was supposed to be very good. An under the counter filter, multi-stage. About the same time I got um, bit by the Lyme tick and I just wasn't getting well. And they told me that my arthritis and my ringing ears and this and all of these problems were actually symptoms of chronic Lyme disease. Does this sound familiar to you? Chronic long, long Lyme disease, right? right. So I've got, I've, I've got this. So I accepted those diagnoses because I had a good filter, you know? Right. And the water tasted a lot better. And it was much more convenient than lugging all those, those gallons of water anyway. So I, that was 1991. Well, in 2014, I'm lying on the couch my liver is swollen. I'm having kidney troubles. The arthritis is so bad, I can hardly walk. I, I'm beginning to feel suicidal. I'm really, because it was just, it was just getting too much. Yeah. Still chronic gastrointestinal problems. And I said, wait a minute, before I do anything drastic, let's just get really strict about the fluoride again. Really, really strict. Let's go because I'd heard that maybe the filter is not good enough. And I went to just using no fluoride, bottled water. And nine days later, I'm lying in bed and my eyes popped open. It was like a switch had been turned on. I realized I was not in pain. The switch had been turned off. It was just nine days. Wow. Nine days. I had been sick for 23 years. And I knew better. I knew I couldn't use fluoridated toothpaste because they gave me mouth sores. Right. But I still could not believe that it could be so bad that it would be causing all these symptoms. Yeah. I could not believe that my government would allow something that was so bad. I remember saying to myself, well, if I'm that sensitive, I deserve to be sick because it's good for everybody else. Right. My so life matters, and, and I'm not that I'm not that special. There are many people like me. Yeah. But now I have the internet. Right. And I'm an analyst. And I did my due diligence. Like um, um, Brenda, I got into PubMed. And I found it. And I found all the studies. I found the studies going back decades. I've looked at studies from every decade going back to 1915. Their evidence is there, and, and they just covered it up for whatever reasons. They liked the magic potion narrative, and they decided that my life and the lives of my children did not matter. So anyway, I started writing. I was, you asked how I got involved in this lawsuit. Um, so one day, I'd written a letter to the editor in the newspaper, a local newspaper, and I'd written several, and other people were writing letters about fluoride. It was a big thing in the community all of a sudden. And this group of trolls, and I had researched them, was online screaming at us, oh, you're ignorant, you don't know anything. So it was Easter afternoon, 2015. And if you're reading your local paper, you think these are local people. And I saw that, um, I called one of them out who was you know, giving me a hard time telling me I was stupid and I didn't know anything in social media. And I said, hey, you're not even part of this community. You, you made the papers in your home state. And he took umbrage and he thought that you know, he said, oh, he was never filed with ethics charges. I didn't say he was filed. I said he, he made the papers for ethical missteps or something of that nature, you know. And the next thing I know, within minutes, within minutes, I had people on Easter Sunday afternoon, people from Florida, North Carolina, Colorado, um, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, on my local paper berating me. And I realized how organized they were. And so I sat down and I wrote this huge letter. I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew Erin Barakovich, got a bunch of signatures. And the next thing, people knew who I was. And then I continued on doing more writing. And as I said, I'm an analyst, so I can string words together and do research fairly well. And um, I was invited to um, join this lawsuit because of my activism. Beautiful. So you actually got Aaron Brockovich involved? Aaron, 
Yeah, Aaron Brockovich was being um, lobbied by lots of people and had been for years. And there were several others who were lobbying her at the same time. And I had a in to Bob Bocock, who was her water guy. And so people would be talking to Erin, and she would talk to Bob, and then Bob would phone me. <laughs> and so I, I did write this letter, and I said, would she sign it? Because a letter from little old me isn't going to mean anything. But I had dentists, doctors, scientists, and a lawyer. Always have a lawyer on your side. And Erin Brockovich all signed this letter. And then it meant something. And then it meant something. And I just put my name in the corner, prepared by K. Spencer, you know. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad you got to the bottom of it. Um, and and what's interesting when I listen to both of your stories is, you know, if you look at the statistics, you know, we're in, America has a chronic illness issue right now. Our mm -hmm. level of chronic illness has exponentially exploded and it's increasing, expected to increase even more over the next couple of decades. That's what, you know, the CDC says, all these major organizations are saying, but yet we're more technologically advanced, we're more medicated than ever. And it just doesn't add up. And if you look at the numbers of, let's say, cancer, back in the 1970s, you had like a one in seven or one in 10 chance of getting cancer. Now you have a one in three chance of getting cancer. So something is going on. We're doing something happened in, in that time frame that, you know, it goes back back further to that. You mentioned cancer, and I believe it was Dean Burke who was um, the National Cancer um, VA or, or some some government agency. He testified in a lawsuit, and he he did the math. And he showed that the cancer rates went up in Florida communities, wow. and the government did the math and said no, it didn't. Mm. And when he was asked to explain that, he said, well, you know, they left out an important data set. And when you leave out this important data set, then it doesn't show up. You've got, you've got to do it right. So as I said, I'm an analyst. I understand data manipulation. And when I started getting into this whole fluoride research business, I'm seeing the vague terms. I'm seeing conclusions that are not supported by the content. I'm seeing references that aren't saying what the study the, is saying that the references say. And so I was seeing a lot of evidence, not just of mistakes, but of systemic um, malfeasance to um, get the conclusion they wanted. The fix was in, the fix was in. And I had arthritis all through my 40s and 50s. And here I am in my 60s without arthritis. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not the only one. So people yeah. are getting sicker. Yes, they're getting sicker because of the poison in our water, the poison in our foods, poisons in our medicine. And fluoride is, is one of the first ones. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because the from my research over the last little bit since I've started digging into fluoride, the CDC says, well, you know, dental cavities or caries, as they say, dental caries have, have been reduced since we started fluoride by X amount. But then I found a Harvard study that pulled data from countries across the world and from, from I think it was 1975 to 2014 of dental like cavities, um, teeth, you know, tooth decay, et cetera. And they compared and graphed the countries that fluorinate, which were, I think it was just nine or nine of them. Um, and they compared that in a graph against about 22 countries that don't fluorinate. And the, the graph on both, was the same essentially they both declined around the same amount over that period of time so i was like okay they're leaving that little detail out of their statistics there which is interesting now dental promoters of fluoride tell us that it occur occurs naturally on earth and it's released from rocks and soil into water and those who oppose fluoride often say there's a difference between the natural fluoride and the manufactured fluoride that's added to our public water system. So what's the deal with this? What are the differences and how are they the same? What do we need to know about it? So what's naturally occurring is calcium fluoride. And that's found in like the seawater and stuff like that. And a lot of people like to bring up um, how great shark teeth are because they are high in fluoride, but they actually lose their teeth a lot <laughs> and they regrow them. 
they don't keep the same set of teeth their whole life. Um, and then, so my utility adds fluorosilicic acid. It's the waste product of the phosphate fertilizer industry. When they mine the phosphorus, it comes with, you know, fluorine and uh, radioactive uh, molecules, radioactive nucleotides is the word I'm trying to think of. Um, there's also, there can be lead and arsenic and all kinds of stuff. And they add um, sulfuric acid to break apart those substances so they can have the phosphorus for the fertilizer. And so it makes this like toxic emissions that they can't let go out the smokestacks because it would poison all the crops and the animals. So they have to put it through a wet scrubber system. So that captures the fluoride into a, the hydro is the water and then the fluorosilicic acid. And it's very corrosive. Um, I know some water utilities, I think Karen, for instance, yours may, I don't think you're fluoridated right now, but your previous water utility used sodium fluoride. That's correct. Um, is that typically from phosphate fertilizer or is that aluminum manufacturing? That's more manufacturing companies. And ours in my old community was imported from Shanghai. It was literally... Um, material that they had captured from the smokestacks of metal manufacturers in Shanghai, China. And they were importing it to my community, Gloucester, Massachusetts at that time, and dumping it in our water. Packaged Shanghai smog. Now, um, another community um, nearby was using sodium fluoride and they were also importing it from China, not from Shanghai, but from near Shanghai. And the gentleman called up the um, company and asked, I want to know exactly where this stuff is coming from and how are you getting it? And they were told, he was told it was harvested from a, a factory in China. <laughs> We're so worried about having TikTok from China, but yeah. we're taking the, 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 the water pride from their smokestacks and dumping it into our water supply. Makes we're sense. Where ninety nine percent of it go right into the environment. Yes. Only about one percent is um, consumed by people. Maybe another half percent or so is consumed by pets and horses and you know animals that you might find in a in a semi um, semi um, suburban type area but it's all going into our environment they don't want it in their environment in china or mexico it's another big exporter of of this chemical so we're dumping it into our environment here yeah yeah and and, and what's interesting is that the like you were saying brenda the this this is a byproduct or the waste from the creation of phosphate fertilizers and um, which they take that and they put it on our water, essentially. Um, and 11 states have actually banned phosphate fertilizers for the use of sale because of the harm it does to the environment, which I would assume is why now we're going over to China to get ours from over there. And then now we're seeing all these studies coming out that our chocolate, um, a lot of our herbs and spices, a lot of our baby food have high levels of heavy metals like lead and cadmium and mercury. And it's like, wonder where that's coming from. <laughs> that's, that's the, the other, you know, um, waste, toxic waste that comes from this process of creating fluoride slash phosphate fertilizers. Mm -hmm. I mean, our entire environment is constantly being more and more polluted and industry just keeps making up new, you know, chemicals and they don't have to prove they're safe and they start to sell them. So, that's why we're getting so sick. It's not, it's not just the fluoride, you know, we got this and that, and we're just being bombarded by everything. You know, we have PFAS in everything in our houses and our rugs and mattresses and, you know, all the, you know, fragrances and all this stuff, like we're just being bombarded, but fluoride is the easiest thing I think to get rid of because we're purposely adding it to our drinking water. And all you have to do is turn off that pump. We don't have to do any special treatment of the water. It's not going to cost them millions of dollars. Like they're investing in PFAS remediation right now, which is interesting. And we'll probably go over that when we go over the history of fluoride, we'll touch upon PFAS a little. 
Absolutely. Yes. I want to definitely talk about the history of it. Um, and, and as you mentioned, just real quick, the, I was looking at numbers because we use our taxpayer money pays for the fluoride that gets put into our water and just the state of the, or just the city of Phoenix. I can't remember what year it was, but I pulled the documents and it said that year, I think it was 2015 or 16. It was about 580,000 just for the city of Phoenix to fluorinate the water. So, I mean, how much are we spending as a country? And so, and the, I'm sorry, my utility, the rate payers are paying for the fluoride. So it's part of the water bill. They're not really, the government's not paying for it. But the, what the government is paying for is all the marketing materials and the CDC promotion. Um, CDC gives grants out to a lot of different water utilities to upgrade their systems because it's so corrosive. It eats all the pumps away and stuff. So they have to replace this stuff. So CDC has full-time staff dedicated to fluoride. They have a fluoride engineer. And then they also give funds to HHS, Health and Human Services, for different states. Not all the states have a fluoride program coordinator, but my state, for instance, Wisconsin, has a full-time fluoride program coordinator to protect the program, show up at city council meetings, and defend it no matter what. Um, they also promote, you know, the dental sealants of fluoride, anything having to do with fluoride. They used to also do a lot of the fluoride tablets. And I called them out at a conference one time about the tablets not being FDA approved. And she got really huffy and puffy with me. And she was like, doctors and dentists would never prescribe a drug that was not FDA, FDA approved. And I was like, whatever. So I sent her all my emails that I had with FDA that confirmed these fluoride supplements had never been FDA approved. And they were considered a health hazard because they never went through any safety and effectiveness studies. So Wisconsin did start to back off of those. And I would call a lot of the um, different counties to ask them why they got rid of their sodium fluoride tablet program. And they said, because painting it on the teeth is way more effective than giving these kids these tablets. They had no idea that these tablets were not FDA approved. And I believe that's why they were backing off of it was because I kept nagging them about it because they were spending so much money promoting it and giving them out. Interesting. And Brenda and I have both seen um, interesting little impacts from our activism, which uh, is very satisfying. It's um, it's difficult, and it, you know you're, you're you're unsung heroes, and it doesn't really matter. We we just don't want to see our children and our grandchildren and and our neighbors and our friends all continue to be poisoned. I had two girlfriends who were both really suffering. One was really bad with arthritis and she couldn't walk. The other one was worried she was going to have to have a hip replacement. Um, one was drinking. She didn't wasn't in a fluoridated community, but she was drinking a lot of tea. Hmm. And I said, give up the tea, give up the tea. Now, instead of not being able to walk across the room without falling down and thinking she was going to need hip surgery, she's going for six-mile hikes. Wow. The other one was, wasn't was able to, you know, cope in, and was just really stuck in her chair all the time. Now she's using bottled water to make her pasta and her rice and her soups and to wash everything. And her arthritis is much, much, much better. Maybe not totally gone like mine, but much, much better. And her doctor says, well, it must have been something else in the water. It couldn't possibly have been the fluoride. But that's what it was. This study after study. And if you go to the website that Brenda and I have, um, fluoridelawsuit.com, we put together a collection of, of, right now it's about 150 studies, I think, um, just published after 2015, showing how it's bad for bones, it's bad for thyroids, it's bad for kidneys, it's bad for, for, for all kinds of things. And it causes or worsens arthritis. Yes, there, there there is a lot of studies now. So definitely go check those out. Do your own digging, do your own research and, and learn um, all about this and its health effects. Before we get into the history, I just want to read this um, really quickly. This is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the NOAA. It's a science-based federal agency. No. And they have on their website, the chemical data sheets of all different chemicals. So this is the chemical data sheet information of fluorosilic acid, which is per the CDC, it's one of the main one um, additives, chemical fluoride additives that's used in the 
uh, U.S. water system. So the general description of it is a color colorless fuming liquid with a penetrating pungent odor, corrosive to mental to metals and tissue. Both the fumes and very short contact with the liquid can cause severe and painful burns used in water fluoridation and hardening, hardening cement and ceramics as a wood um, preservative. It requires the label, the hazard label corrosive and protective clothing, rubber gloves and safety glasses are required when handling it. Um, it's okay for you. Yeah, that's it. Kind of like everything you read before it says you get to the point where it says used in water fluoridation. You get yeah. Wait. Yeah. Does it say do not swallow, do not inhale, do not touch? I mean, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I'm not on the site right now. I just pulled the general description, but I, I believe it has all the, yes, it has all those because you can't you know, you can't get it on your skin at all. You, yeah, if you inhale it, it goes through all the procedures, et cetera. So very toxic, um, says the federal agency NOAA, which is interesting. Yeah. When it's stored, they have a sticker on the barrel that says like, do not touch do, or do not uh, get on your skin contact. Do not inhale, do not ingest. <laughs> highly like toxic but just a little bit is okay just a little tiny bit right and that's With, the confusing part they don't you know they they promote it as it's just a little tiny drop yeah. but if you look and compare it to PFAS these days and how small of an amount of PFAS is highly toxic to us the fluoride amount that they put in our water is way bigger of a dose than the little tiny PFAS, you know, they try to sell it to you as like, it's just a little bit and it can't hurt you because it's too small now. And, 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 and people have different susceptibilities. You know, I will admit I'm, I'm one of the more hypersensitive people. Um, from my reading of the literature uh, in, in the area of autoimmunity, um, I would say that about 15 to 20% of the population is like me. And will be diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and arthritis and tendinitis and, you know, right. eczema and psoriasis and all these other things. And we just kind of say, what can you do about it? Give me some creams, medicines, whatever you, you deal. But it's really fluoride poisoning. It's the early stages. Uh, it, it's stage two, stage three of skeletal fluorosis is what we're experiencing. Um, but they, they don't really understand. They don't really want to understand that these lives are the, the these people are the canaries in the coal mine it is bad for everybody and when you're taking it year after year after year you're really doing a lot of damage and and, and, and that's just totally immoral yeah. tell the kids to brush their teeth it's not helping them with their teeth anyway but you know tell the kids to brush the teeth don't tell me that I should be hospitalized with a, a swollen liver and have kidney issues and arthritis so bad, you know, because some kid isn't brushing his teeth. Yeah. You know, that th this is this is just an immoral medical mandate. Yeah, it's it's definitely concerning. The more research I do, I'm um, baffled as to um, what we're doing here and why we can't find a better way. And I feel like we should be more involved now with our science and techniques of, I mean, we were just learning about the oral microbiome. And there are things like oral probiotics that they're finding that actually can help dental issues. They're not mm -hmm. at all. So that's something we need to kind of keep fighting for and, and figure out a better way. Cause it sounds like there's a better way. Like you said, we can brush our teeth. We can have better hygiene. We can eat better foods, we can eat less sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now I want to get into the history of this because this started in the U S in the 1940s. And Brenda, you had shared with me um, before the show that the Florida program kind of all stems from something called the Manhattan project. And you also sent me a great book called the fluoride deception, which I have, if you're interested in the topic, definitely it's a must read. It gives a lot of great information. It's written by a journalist, everything, all the sources are cited. So you can really kind of dive into details. Um, I know this is a really big topic, but what are some of the important things we need to know about how it came about for Florida to be added to the public drinking water in the U.S.? 
So the story that I kind of, the way that I understand it was that um, DuPont in New Jersey was manufacturing the atomic bombs to drop on Japan. And during that, they noticed that a lot of the employees had central nervous system damage and mental confusion. And also the emissions from the smokestacks were blowing and the direction that they would tend to blow in, they would cripple the cows and the animals and they would cause like the peach crops to fail and get this weird blight. And so the scientists figured out that it was actually, it looked like the fluorine or the fluoride compound they were using for the enriching of the uranium. And it wasn't actually the radioactive uranium that was causing these problems. So they were concerned that they were going to get sued and have litigation. So the U.S. Public Health Service was given a grant by the government to find a benefit to fluoride. And there was a dentist out in Colorado who was studying the Colorado brown stain, they call. And a lot of the dentists will talk about the Colorado brown stain story. And what they found were these people had the <clears throat> brown fluorosis teeth and they linked it to the fluoride level. But they also found these people had lower tooth decay rates, which I believe that the lower tooth decay rates was probably from the calcium, magnesium, and high mineral content in that water. And also for like a hundred years before that, companies sold this tooth powder for people to brush away the brown stain. So those people may have been self-conscious of having that brown stain on their teeth. So they have may have been brushing their teeth in a time when nobody else was brushing their teeth. So that may have been what lowered their tooth decay rates. But anyway, U.S. Public Health Service kind of grasped onto this, and they started in 1945 fluoridating Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it was supposed to last 10 to 15 years for this trial. But after five years, they started to fluoridate the control city. And we have internal like letters and stuff where states, other states were reaching out to find out how well their program was working. And then these letters, they were saying, well, we can't really tell the difference in tooth decay rates yet, but we're sure the program works and you should do it too. And in Wisconsin, city, the city in Michigan used their people as like the guinea pigs in a trial without them knowing it, or did they know? Oh, no, it was very well advertised. Yeah. And there was two, there were two, a couple of cities. It was also Newburgh, Kingston in New Jersey, as well as the Grand Rapids and um, the other one in, um, was in, 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 in the Midwest where, where Brenda is. Okay. In Michigan. Michigan, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, Wisconsin dentists played a really critical role in getting fluoride to so many communities. They had a goal of 50 communities by 1950. So Madison, Wisconsin approved it in 1946 one year after they started this trial. And there were a lot of other states or cities in Wisconsin that did it as well. And then other states started adopting it and it was just unstoppable. And that first, those first fluoride trials, they were demonstrations. They were done by these dentists that wanted to show their new pet project was this like amazing beneficial thing. They, they weren't really critical thinkers. They weren't looking, they didn't study neurotoxicity back then and all these things. They didn't look at the thyroid. And, and I believe they did see some negative stuff in their studies and they just ignored it and covered it up. Karen can probably elaborate on some of this. Oh yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's e even worse. Apparently, um, Harold Hodge, who was the lead um, guy there in the Manhattan Project, having because he was a dentist and he knew a lot about fluoride and fluorine, he's the one who said, gee, well, maybe we can sell this as something that was good for teeth. Now, that was a concept that dated back to like the eight, late 1900s, I believe. And it had been definitively disproved by 1915 and 1925. 1925, Johns Hopkins did a study and said, Contrary to the old belief, you know, teeth are particularly sensitive to damage from fluoride. 
And in 1937, Kaj Roham wrote the definitive textbook. It's a tome. It, it, it's, it's, it's the thing about how you should never use fluoride or anything. And you shouldn't let women or children um, near fluoride ever because it's, it's very bad and has um, potentially bad impacts on the developing fetus. So if men have to work with it, okay, but women and children should never work with it because of its ill effects. So they knew all of that back then, but they, Hodge was the one who put the, um, the bug in the ear of um, Alcoa, one of the, um, the um, polluters, big polluters uh, that had a lot of lawsuits against them for all the damage they were doing to the crops from their smokestacks and stuff. And so in the 1940s, Oscar Hewing, who was a lead lawyer in one of these major industrial polluters with all these lawsuits against him, became the head of the FSA, which was a precursor to Health and Human Services. And he's the one who really pushed this through because once they managed to convince people and they found that guy in Colorado to be their spokesperson. I'm, I am the, you know, Jimmy Stewart guy who rides into town like, um, you know, going to kill, kill the bad guy and, and get rid of the, save all the, all the people from tooth decay and everything. They set him up as, as a patsy to be the image of the American hero against fluoride to sell the story. Um, but it really was more of an NCIS cover-up uh, type story rather than an old Western story that they tried to sell us. And so once this, this fluoride lawyer who was the head of FSA, which was the precursor of Health and Human Services, managed to say, okay, we're just going to end the studies quickly because they were seeing bad things and just tell about everybody they should do it, then all of those lawsuits went away because now fluoride's a good thing. And I think it's important to keep in mind around those times, the 1930s, maybe early 40s, I don't know how far into the 40s, they were selling smoking tobacco as a good thing and pregnant women should do it to make their babies taller. I mean, I've read crazy like ads from back from like 30s, I think it was 30s and 40s, maybe, I don't know when. Into the 50s, you get pictures of a woman with a cigarette in one hand and a martini in the other and the big pregnancy, smaller baby, great, easier delivery. Yes, that's the one I we, I did a show on that, and I was appalled. I was like, "Wait, what?" But so, I mean, I think those are important things to realize around that time. Those kind of things were being sold as great for pregnant women, so we should probably question a lot of the things that were sold and uh, for good. Well, I, I, I sent you a study where Harold Hodge is one of the um, authors. It was just a small study, and it was published in the early fifties. And they were measuring the amount of fluoride in the placentas of women who were giving birth in fluoridated communities. So the fluoride level was one parts per million. And the amount of fluoride, the concentration in the placenta was two parts per million. Mm -hmm. And the, the authors of the study opined, well, we really don't know how much is getting through to the baby, but in any event, it's probably not enough to harm the mother. What? That's, that's what the study said. That's what the study said. I am quoting it almost word for word. I sent you that attachment. Almost word for word. We don't know. Now, prior to 1940, one parts per million in the water was considered toxic and dangerous, and you've got to get rid of it. So what they did in 1940 was they said, or 1945, they said, oh, one part to 1.2, 1.4 parts is actually good for you. And we're going to say it's absolutely fine up to 2.4 parts per million in the water, which got rid of all the lawsuits. And they said... And it's not going to do anyone any harm until it gets to 10 megs per day or whatever, 10 pots of whatever, so 10. Now, that had, they were, they were trying to fit, fit their agenda into what was actually accepted chemistry then, which said you needed to have a safety factor of 10 for something you're consuming. So if they're saying it's safe up until 10, then one pot is perfectly fine. 
and putting 2.4, like I said, well, that was reasonable. And that would, you know, comparatively speaking, and that would get rid of the losses. And, you know, nobody's going to have any harm from this. But they were doing, the, when they did start doing the studies on the babies, they were finding, well, it's two pots. It's not 2.4, certainly less than 10. But these are babies, these are fetuses. In the mid-1980s, um, polluters, actually, I think it was Strom Thurmond down in South Carolina, saying, oh, we need to have that level of, of that threshold, that contaminant level increased because we're putting so much more pollutants, fluoride pollutants into the environment. So the EPA asked a group of scientists to decide whether four parts per million would be a safe concentration level so they can raise it from 2.4 to four parts per million. Well, the group came back and said, no, it wouldn't be safe. The report was issued and they changed it to said, yes, it would be okay. And the author said, what? That's not what we said. And they didn't know what to do about it because the authorities, you know, published something that they didn't say. And so they increased it to four parts per million. Sounds like there's a in, lot of lobbying going on from special interest groups in this whole scenario. Absolutely. In 1993, the National Research Council said, well, we really don't have any evidence that our maximum contaminant level goal of four is safe, but we're going to give it a provisional pass and advise the EPA that they should do their research. This was in 1993, I believe. In 2006, the National Research Council came out and said, four parts per million is definitely not safe. And there is no evidence of any safety level, especially for susceptible subpopulations, which brings us back to Brenda and me and, and the lawsuit that we're involved with. This was in 2006. The National Research Council with the National Academy of Sciences has that. And that's a good point for people to understand. It's kind of like this new um, shot that they've created to help people get over a certain pandemic that just happened. It's similar to certain people are very, you know, susceptible to, to having major, you know, sometimes even death or heart injury or major physical injuries. Injury, it's the same kind of thing with fluoride, it sounds, where there's a certain population that can be severely impacted by it and others maybe less, although it still is probably damaging them, but we're not seeing, you know, major right. health issues kind of right. off that. Right. I, had, I had several cousins who, you know, had um, developed blood clots after um, getting the shot. And, you know, it's something that's genetic. You just don't know. Yeah, everybody just don't. That's why we can't have these blanket things when it comes to health. No, you can't. And, you know, when they put it in the water, it's, it's bad enough. And we're not certainly not going to go down that other road. But when you put it in the water or you put it in the air, you can't get away from it. There's yeah. no choice involved. Yeah. There is absolutely no, everybody needs to breathe air and drink water. And we're putting it in the water again. 98 to 99% of it is going directly into the environment where it's contaminating our groundwater. And we're importing it from major polluters in the United States, as well as polluters in Mexico and China. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you guys are fighting a good fight. Um, and I'm going to link this below because the British government actually did a study in 2000 on this called the York Review, which of course was criticized by certain people. Um, and they did the report to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of water fluoridation. And they found that there were 26 studies done on whether water fluoridation prevents cavities. And none of the 26 studies were characterized as being an A category class of evidence. And there were also zero randomized control trials um, in any of the 26 studies. So it doesn't sound like there was sufficient. I mean, we, it definitely wasn't the level of our, you know, what we require today as, you know, if we we're going to blanket the entire United States with a certain, you know, 
Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the 2015 Cochrane Review of the same thing, having to looking at the efficacy of fluoridation had the same findings as the 2000 York Review. There was no evidence that it reduced economic, social economic um, um, health disparities, no evidence that it was good for adults, but there was evidence that fluoride in the water at concentrations deemed optimal to say we're going to cause 40% or more of the population to develop dental fluorosis. Mm. And, and, and dentists say, oh, you know, we're so good. You know, we're going to put ourselves out of business. You won't get any cavities if you have fluoride. Well, that's not true. But if you have dental fluorosis as a young adult, these stained and brittle teeth are going to bother you, and you're going to spend a lot of money at the dentist, um, covering them up with veneers or, or crowns. Right. That's a good point because you might, it's kind of counterintuitive because think, oh, all the dentists are promoting fluoride. It's, you know, they want our teeth. They're obviously, that will take money out of their pockets, but that does make a lot of sense. It, it's all P, also PR because you bring your kids to the dentist, especially they always want to give them fluoride treatments. Yeah. So this fluoride is good. Is their public relations um, effort to sell, make it easy for them to sell the fluoride treatments in the dental offices. I had a dentist tell me that a dental, a, a, a good dental office can make between 80,000 and $400,000 a year on fluoride treatments. Wow. You know, I, this is just hearsay. This is just what a dentist told me. I can't document that. But, you know, they are selling fluoride treatments. Right. That's and, they are, and they are covered by insurance for children. And so this is, this is a moneymaker. That makes more sense when you know a little more details about that side of things. And I think I read, in, like today, current studies are showing that fluoride it's more like a 15 to 35% decrease in cavities where when they first, you know, were starting this whole thing, it was, they were saying it was like 65. Well, it's like you're, you're, go, go ahead, Brenda. It's like three, 3%. Three wow. <laughs> no, 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 it's one third, it's one third of 1%. Well, yeah, I think I'm, quote, I'm quoting the CDC. The CDC is oh. saying like 15. Oh, well, this, well, well the, C, the yeah. CDC is a whole other animal. But right. The most recent studies done, like um, Sanders and Slade, the dynamic duo from North Carolina, or Hi Guys, um, they did a couple of studies looking at NHANES data, and this is National Health Survey data that they do every few years, but looking at kids in teenagers in fluoridated communities and non-fluoridated communities who drank tap water. And they found it was difference of like 0.3 surfaces of a single cavity. Now a cavity has three, four, five surfaces. So it's one third of one surface, one cavity difference. And they Agreed. They wrote, well, you know, the clinical implications of this is inconsequential. But if you multiply it out, that's a lot of cavities. Well, that's like saying one woman can make a, a baby in nine months, so nine women can make a baby in one month. No, one, the kid, maybe you have that's a it, cavity. That, <laughs> it's a cavity that's a little bit smaller. And, and they noticed that the kids who were drinking tap water in the fluoridated communities had higher lead levels in their blood. Because again, the fluoride is very caustic and it's polluted with all kinds of other things. They opined, and again, this is practically an exact quote. Um, you can look it up, it's pretty close. Is well, the effects of lead poisoning take years to manifest, where cavities are a more immediate concern. Really? Really? They, the national health data that's coming from a combination project with the FDA and the CDC is showing kids who drink fluoridated tap water are more likely to have higher levels of lead. And they're saying a cavity is more important. A fraction of a cavity, which is clinically insignificant, inconsequential, makes no difference. If you believe in it, if you, if you believe you've got to have fluoride, brush your teeth with it. It is an 
anti-enzymic poison. So if you put it on your teeth and you've got cavity-causing bacteria on your teeth and you brush your teeth with it, it will be killing or weakening that bacteria. So you'll be a little less likely to get cavities, at least for the next couple of hours. Those bacteria will be, you know, kind of in a weak state. So if you believe in it and it doesn't bother you, go ahead, brush your teeth with it, ignoring the environmental pollution you're causing. But, you know, that's a whole other issue. Or buy gallon of bottled water if you want to drink it but it is not doing it's causing dental fluorosis in approximately half of the kids who, who consume it and that's going to have big dental bills so it's not helping your teeth right. it's helping the dentist's pocketbook frankly and i don't and when i want to make take a moment to say i do not think all the dentists are in on this big conspiracy i believe many of them are ignorant of this they want to believe the hype. They were taught this. They, they trusted their teachers and they were taught this and they don't want to know anything else. So I believe that many of them are truly ignorant of this. They, they weren't as crazy as Brenda and I and sat down and did thousands of hours of research. Others are willfully blind and I've spoken to some of them. Well, yeah, but you know, if we say anything, we could use, lose patience or we'll anger our other people. So we're going to keep our mouth shut. It's really not doing any good and it could be doing some harm, but it's really, I, I, I can't say anything. It would hurt me to say anything. You know, they're, they're, they're cowards. But there are, there are some who are overtly dishonest, who know the damage it's doing. Absolutely, because you can tell by the way they phrase their answers and how they, they word things and how they're behaving. There are some who are, are narcissistic, sociopathic, Machiavellian devils, um, but that's only a minority of the dentists. So I'm not blaming all the dentists for this. They believe what they were taught. Right. Right. I believed it for years. I believed it for years. Yeah, I didn't know the extent of everything until like the last month or two since I've started digging into it for all these articles. Um, and I'm so glad I did because uh, I've learned a whole lot. Um, and I think that's a great point you make about it. It reminds me of the issue with antibiotics. Like if you take an antibiotic, yes, it will kill the bad bacteria, but also kills the good bacteria and causes a lot of different issues. So you try to avoid antibiotics. The same thing, if this is killing bacteria that causes um, cavities in your mouth, it's also probably going to kill or harm the good bacteria, which we're now learning the, the oral microbiome is vital when it comes to fighting off viruses, when it comes to fighting off diseases and infections. And there's so many um, things that happen within the oral microbiome to create that shield and barrier that if we're killing, killing it every time we drink water, um, that could cause a lot of health problems. Mm -hmm. Now, in the course of your own ongoing lawsuit against the EPA, it came to light that Health Secretary Rachel Levine and NIH Director Lawrence Tabak intervened to stop the release of the most recent study on Flora's toxicity by the National Toxicology Program, which has now since been released per the court order. Can you share with us a little more about this um, what the new, and what the new report is saying about fluoride? So the new report is in its, it's still a draft. Um, is this, I believe it's, they've done five versions of the report now. They were supposed to release the fourth version in May of 2022. We have all their internal emails where they set the date. They had all their talking points together and then it never came out. And it was the health secretary or the assistant health secretary who stepped in. But um, I saw that they did another one, I believe in June, a June 2022 version, and then also a September, if I recall correctly, 2022. So maybe it's even the sixth version now. No, it is the fifth. And the, anyway, like the draft still finds no safe level of fluoride. There is no threshold to it. But, you know, Johnny Johnson of the American Fluoridation Society put out a press release this week saying that it confirms how safe fluoride is, which it's just, he's a spin doctor. That's what he is. Uh, he's the he's the polished cowboy, one of my marketing friends calls him. So this report, as soon as it comes out as a final version, it's going to end water fluoridation, especially in my community. They're just waiting for it to be a finalized document. Right. 
Yeah, that's interesting. It's, I, I, I obtained a copy myself and I read through it and there's all the metadata and there's all the notes you can read. Um, and we're going to post a link to it below so you can check it out yourself. But it does say that it's a neurotoxic chemical that can be harmful to humans. <laughs> the, the, the EPA, an EPA um, team, Monday, Monday was the lead author, um, put it on the list of 100 um, um, neurotoxicants with substantial evidence of harm in 2009. And then in um, 2015, I believe, or 2014, I forget, um, they identified it as one of the top 21 um, gold standard neurotoxicants that people should be aware of. And so that this, that, but, but they've learned, these, these fluoridationists have learned, all they need to do is wave their hums and deny it and say, look at me. And they get, you know, nice um, um, spokespeople. The best thing you can say for Johnny Johnson is he has a nice, nice head of white hair and a good speaking voice. So he comes across very well. And that is um, why he's out there saying it. You know, you want to believe the distinguished looking um, um, paternalistic person who's speaking with authority. It doesn't mean he's truthful just because he looks the part. The same thing for the CDC directors, Karen, Dr. Karen Hacker and Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Shame on them. Shame on them for what they wrote to Brenda and myself about this. Um, the, neuro, the, the NTP study is a systematic review just looking at the developmental neurotoxicity. But there are other, multiple other studies showing that it's damaging to thyroids and to bones and to kidneys and everything else. And they'll say, oh, there's, there, there was one study in there that they said was, well, wasn't good quality. Right. We have hundreds thousands that are showing that this is damaging and and then they just wave their hands and make a lot of noise right and i understand okay it could be helpful to kill some sort of bacteria in the mouth that causes you know there could be some sort of research that says that and there could be a percent chance that it says that but if there is a shadow of the doubt that it causes any physical harm to children or babies or pregnant women or any human life, we need to, you know, the people that want to buy fluoride and take it, we can, they can still make that available and Absolutely. take it out of the water supply. It doesn't make sense why they're, you know, blanketing across and not giving people the option and just kind of enforcing it and putting us at risk for something that is a possibility, which is why Europe, you know, especially when it comes to foods and a lot of toxic things in foods, if there is a possibility of something causing harm, they will ban it. And whereas the United States, they're like, what's the probability of it causing harm? So it's this mind frame well, that we're fighting against. But the, the Safe Drinking Water Act says that the water should be safe from any thing in it that has any risk to susceptible subpopulations. They use that, that language, susceptible subpopulations. The Clean Water Act says nobody should intentionally add a pollutant to water. And if you look at your consumer um, um, report that comes out once a year from your water um, board, it'll have a list of contaminants and includes barium and PFAS and all kinds of bad things and fluoride. For the little asterisk, but we add the fluoride because it's good for teeth. It is the only contaminant we add to water, but that is against the letter of the law and the intent of the law of the Clean Water Act. And there are other. All right, go ahead. But they, but they, they it, it's a Byzantine administration where you, they'll, well, but we'll write an exception. We'll write this to make it allowable, whatever. It just blows Brenda and me away to think that that people could to go along with these these um, illogical decisions. Right. And like you were saying, it is I mean, it's listed. I found this the other day in 2003, the um, uh, toxic release inventory list um, lists fluorine as a toxic chemical gas. And as we said before, the other government agency list all these agents are adding to our water as toxic chemicals. So 
Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, and you had mentioned uh, when you were just talking about your kind of working with the CDC because they're handing out fluoride petition participation awards to communities and you've been going back and forth now with them and you've included over 100 cited studies in your correspondence and um you know there's been some interesting conversations so during the course of the communication kind of tell us about that what 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 kind of exchange have you had with Dr. Hacker at the CDC um what's their response been like and um what actions would you like to see from the CDC regarding fluoridation well, we really haven't gotten any response. They haven't really given us any legitimate response. They've just kind of told us to pound sand. Um, so the letter stemmed from one of my local communities got a fluoridation award and it made all the news. And so I reached out and I said, hey, I saw uh, Menominee, Michigan got a fluoridation award. Why are you still award giving people participation trophies when you know this substance is neurotoxic to the developing fetus and a bottle fed infant. And they know it is because they had a, a presentation the year before by the lead scientists who are doing the neurotoxicity studies right now. So they had Dr. Grandjean present to them and Bruce Lampier and Christine Till. So they know and so their job is to be proactive and to protect us. But instead, they're giving out these trophies. It's costing us money to give out these trophies. And it's something that they can promote all over the press is how amazing fluoride is. And they didn't even read any of our citations. They cited the 2015 HHS report where they lowered the fluoride level from 1.0 to 1.2 down to 0.7 because too many kids had fluorosis. One of the authors of that HHS report from 2015 was Dr. Linda Birnbaum. And there was just an AP quote from her last week about how, yeah, yeah, fluoride is, it looks like it's toxic to the developing fetus and infant. So these people had a change on their opinions based on the most current science now, and we need to change our policies. We should not wait 20 years after we know something is harmful. Look at PFAS. It's taken so long. We still don't really have a PFAS regulation that is like something that has to be, you know, they don't have their maximum contaminant level set yet. But I have known PFAS since 2001, I think I knew about PFAS from Teflon Cookware. You shouldn't use it. But, you know, it's 2023 and we still don't have a standard and it's polluting all the water. So I don't, you know, the lead standard, for instance, EPA was supposed to work on their lead standard. They fast tracked it. It took something like 18 years to fast track their lead standard. So it takes really, a really long time for these longer government. Than approving a, it's longer than approving a, um, a, uh, a shot or a medication. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, DuPont knew back in 1961 that um, the, the PFAS were dangerous and the Teflon and the Scotch Guide and all of that stuff. And um, the PFAS, the F in the PFAS stands for fluorine. And, you know, we use the word fluorine and fluoride and fluorinated and fluoridated interchangeably. They're, they're, there's, there's subtle differences. But like the confusing. I think people hear fluoride, but there's like 10 different types of fluoride and there's all these other chemical agents that are created that are put in our water that we call fluoride but they're not fluoride well well they are and they, they but they, but but, but it's, it's really different fluorine is an element on the periodic chart of elements and it's the most reactive one it's very very intense i think of it sort of like the vanilla you add to your cooking you know you can add all the, kinds of the chemicals the symbol f is that what the one you're talking about? The F, yes. Okay. And, you know, it, it, you know, you put a lot of sugar in something, but it's when you put the vanilla in it, you get the sweetness and the taste. So it intensifies a lot of things. It's very reactive. And so it's very handy in industry for making a lot of things. And if you look at the PFAS um, um, molecule, you'll see it's mostly Fs. Mm -hmm. And if you find PFAS in your water, the community will pretty easily find out who was the pollutant who was putting the PFAS in the water. Now, the PFAS industry, I've heard, 
solution that they're working on is to make the PFAS break down more rapidly into its individual components. So then it'll break down into the P's and the F's and the O's and the A's and the S's, whatever. But the F is the part that is the most intense, the most reactive. And fluoride is, and the fluoride ion or the fluoride compounds, they bind with metals. So if you've got different aluminum in your water, for example, which is not uncommon, um, you'll get aluminum fluoride. It'll bind with that. You, and then it dissociates and you drink it. And so now you just got the fluoride ion, which they say is identical to the calcium fluoride when they disassociate. Yeah, I'm not a chemist. I'm not going to go there. But when you get into your body and the fluoride gets into your bladder, it's going to create hydrogen fluoride, which is very caustic and very burning. So anybody out there who's ever had issues with <clears throat> ICS and, you know, burning, burning bladder and problems of that nature, or, um, it could be the fluoride. It could be the fluoride in your water that's doing it to you. Like I said, I was having kidney problems, you know, it, in your body, the fluoride is going to be binding with this and breaking up and doing all kinds of things. So um, if the PFAS managed to figure out how to make that dissolve more quickly into the environment, those polluters will be off the hook for polluting the environment. But we will suddenly have this huge increase of fluoride in our environment which will be going into our water and our growing water, and we'll still be consuming it, and we'll still be having the same problems. So it's 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 not you know today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. Right. So what you're saying is, if we stop the fluoridation of our public water supply, they're still creating these toxic gases from their processes that are still going to go into the, our water and our soil. Yeah, it's 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 the, the the industrial revolution, you know, and, and the whole idea where if they can do something, they will do it. And if they can make money, they'll do it a lot. And they don't really care that much about the safety. They, they really don't. Um, not not in this country in particular. Right. Now, you mentioned earlier the recommended amount of fluoride. They've lowered it is now 0.7 milligrams per liter. This is what the APA is saying is the safe amount. In one of your videos, I saw that you speak on the importance of understanding dose versus concentration. Can you kind of explain to us what that means so we can get a good understanding and also kind of get into what other types of foods and liquids have fluoride in them? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start on this and we'll turn it over to Brenda. So if you get a prescription from the doctor, it'll say whatever it is and it'll say what the concentration is. And then it'll have dose instructions. Take one twice a day, take two twice a day, take a half a pill, whatever. You, you know, what, it, it'll tell you what to do as far as your dose. How much do you take? So the concentration in the pill is always the same. It's measured. That's the concentration. But your dose has to do with how much you consume. So when you have your glass of water or you have your liter of water, and, it's, and if it's 0.7 parts per million, that's the equivalent of a dose of 0.7 mg per liter. And they assume that a person's going to consume one liter per day, which they say, oh, it's not that much. It's not that much. But if you have kidney disease or you have diabetes or you're an outdoor worker or you're an athlete, you're drinking a heck of a lot more water. If you were someone like me back when I was so sick, especially, who was making my, my minestrones and soaking my, my beans and changing the water and then cooking it all day and keep adding water, water might boil off, water might drain off, but the fluoride is being absorbed by the beans. And I keep adding more and more water. So when I sit down to eat that, that wonderful, healthy, organic soup I've made, it is, has a very high dose of fluoride for me because of how it got more concentrated for my cooking. And if you are a pregnant woman or a 220 pound man or a bottle fed baby and your doctor gives you a, a prescription with a certain concentration, you're going to be, you should have different doses to begin with, right? You don't give the same dose to all of these different people. But you 
can't figure out what their dose are. When the baby is drinking the bottle fed water, he's, the baby's getting a much higher dose likely than the, than the 220 pound man, even if he's drinking several glasses of water because of the difference between the individual. So dose is a much more um, nuanced concept than concentration, but they conflate dose and concentration. So in our video, um, that Brenda and I made in response to um, the non-responsive reply from Dr. Hacker, Dr. Walensky. We said, come on, doctors, you know the difference between concentration and dose. Don't, don't play us for fools. We, we, we know what's going on here. And their reaction was they had their lawyer contact us and said, the CDC has been instructed, nobody's going to respond to you anymore. If you have anything to say, you can say it to me. So we wrote the lawyer, and of course, she didn't respond to us either. So they, they, they lo lo lawyered up, or as Brenda said earlier, they told us to go pound sand. They know they're lying, and they, and they know we know they're lying, and so they're just going to not say anything. Now, so one thing to note is that the NTP report found the strongest evidence of neurotoxicity at 1.5 milligrams per liter. And so if you're drinking two, uh, if two glasses of water at 0.7, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yes. If you're drinking a, a liter of water at 0.7, if you drink two of those liters, you're getting that 1.5, you're getting 1.4, but you're getting almost that 1.5 with two liters right there. So a lot of people are being exposed to the level that's neurotoxic. And, you know, at my work, we do a water challenge every year. Make sure you drink your eight glasses of water, everyone. So, you know, and a bottle fed infant is getting the biggest dose of it all. And that's right. the most exciting. Well, and you know, oh, sorry, pregnant no. women, pre pregnant women often develop gestational diabetes and diabetes, addicts drink a lot of water. So they're not just drinking two liters of water a day, maybe not they're even drinking three or four or five liters of water a day. And so they're getting, you know, they're getting way in excess of what the National Toxicology Program said was neurotoxic to developing infants. You, you just... You can't say, you can't conflate dose and concentration. And then you also talk about how there's, now there's so many other things with fluoride in it. We have their toothpaste, we have our mouthwash. Um, if you want to talk about what, what else, what I recently learned that there's fluoride in pharmaceuticals, which I'm wondering why there's fluoride. That, is it necessary to have fluoride in pharmaceuticals? And that's not regulated for heavy metals, the fluoride that they put in pharmaceuticals. So you want to talk about what, what else? Actually, getting a Dr. Bigger Peter Briggins, he told me that the reason that they put fluoride in a lot of the antidepressants was because the fluoride will help the chemicals get through the blood brain barrier. And there's tons of antibiotics are high in fluoride, um, grapes, because it's in pesticides. So a lot of, you know, like dirty dozen stuff. Um, dental products, tea. Black tea has very high levels of fluoride. Green um, too. Mm -hmm. So it's everywhere. So you can't control what you're getting through the dose. And yeah. nobody's measuring. That was one of the big things that came up in Wisconsin was um, the retired, I forget if he's a toxicologist for the state. He said, you know, I can't really support this program anymore because first of all, Wisconsin does not track tooth decay rates at all. So we don't know if this program's even working. And then secondly, we're not measuring how much fluoride is in anybody's urine or blood or saliva. So we don't really know the dose or how much is concentrated in these people. So how can we promote that everybody needs this thing when we don't know what the base level is in the population? Right. Well, this, this brings us back to good old Harold Hodge and his group back in the 1940s and all. They did have some data on that, and a lot of that data went missing. We do have bits and pieces of it from writings from back then, and George Walbaugh, my God, he's, he's a saint. I hope he's sitting on a cloud wearing his, his um, wings. He was the doctor who first identified anaphylactic shock from penicillin, 
He identified the first one who identify, identified um, tobacco as causing chronic lung disease. He was, he was an allergist, an environmentalist, way back when he was international reputation. And when he started to see all these people coming in with the fluoridated communities with these symptoms that went away when they left the communities and he figured out it was the flora that was doing it to him, then he started writing about this and he was totally deplatformed, you know, totally, he's, he couldn't get anything published anymore, totally, oh, oh, he was mistreated. And he's written a couple of books. He testified before Congress, I believe in 1954. I read that congressional record and oh my God, you had such wonderful scientists and doctors testifying then, then and they gave you good information. But a lot of that scientific evidence has mysteriously disappeared. So we just have some of a lot of it secondhand now. Um, but it's it's um it's been a long time having this cover up of fluoride and the bad it's been doing. And it's interesting when you what you were saying about kind of going through history, all these doctors getting deplatformed and called quacks, and now people that are trying to get fluoride removed from the water supply are called anti-fluoride activists. It's kind of the same playbook on what's kind of happening now with current stuff. It's it's really interesting. I feel like a lot of Americans also have kind of forgot about the issue and don't really think about it as much anymore. There's been, so, we've been bombarded with so many other things that we've been kind of been, this has kind of been swept on the rug a little bit, but I'm really glad you guys are bringing this information out still. Well, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants and um, we work well together. We, we, we find each other and, and it's, it's interesting. The modern days have given a bigger megaphone to some of the um, bad actors, but they've also given some of us who do not have the finances, uh, the, the, the six figure salary to promote this, like some of these folks who are doing it do, um, to have the, the, the ability to connect with each other and, and get our words out as well. And that's important. Now, for those listening who'd like to minimize fluoride, fluoride in their lives, I know you, Karen, have completely eliminated it. Um, what are all the places um, we can kind of find it and how can we eliminate it from our diets or what are some, what's some on that? Well, the first thing I'd want to say is um, you don't necessarily trust, trust any brand of water because bottled water, because bottled water, they'll have a national brand, but it's sourced from different springs around the country. So you have to find out where the bottled water in your community is actually coming from. And you find that source and make sure you have a good source that way. Um, that said, Pellegrino and Moss, which are imported and are in glass bottles and are very pricey, are safe to drink. So if you're traveling, um, I would get Moss or, or Pellegrino because they are. we do know the source and they are in glass bottles and, and they're okay. But you, that's not good for every day. And there are some people who swear by various um, filtration systems. I suffered for 23 years. I accepted the diagnoses, and it was just my filtration system wasn't good enough. So maybe there's a filtration system out there now, or there'll be a filtration out there system out there a year from now that'll be good enough. But I don't trust it. Um, but you'll have to do your own homework on that. Hmm? We have to look for one that specifically says filters out fluoride. Well, the problem is a lot of them will say that. And I've talked to um, Dr. David Kennedy and various others, and they might do a halfway decent job for the first month or two, but their warranty is for like six months and they're not doing it for that, that length of time. Um, we know um, a woman, Audrey Adams, out in the Pacific Northwest who has an autistic adult child, and he used to get horrible headaches um, after his shower. And so she's finally found a shower system that she likes, but the filtration system is supposed to be changed every six months. She has to change it every two to three months, and she, she has to time his showers. He can only take a shower for so many minutes. If he goes over that, that minutes, he, he'll get a headache. You know, this is an autistic kid. He has no, a, a, a dis, autistic adult. He has no, no agenda here. He gets a headache, he gets a headache, and the whole household suffers for it. So, um, you know, again, canaries in the coal mines. And that's, that's another thing. Um, if you, a lot of the parents of autistic children 
are um, very much aware that fluoride is dangerous and that they need to be out of their diet because some people are more sensitive to things than others. And why the, the, some of these children became artistic may have to do with their inability to get rid of various toxins that they were exposed to early in life like others were. So, you know, go figure. You have, you have to do your own research. Don't eat sardines, though. Sardines are bad. And Brenda said, you know, tea, don't drink green or black tea. Go for the herbal teas that are no fluoride. Um, you have to use it to cook your vegetables. I use it to brush my teeth. I won't even use tap water to brush my teeth. I have a glass bottle of, of water that I add a little um, organic mouthwash to in the bathroom. And my tongue, which had been had a yellow coat on it for years and years and years, is now pink. I'm mm. thrilled. <laughs> there are chemicals in your body. Now, would you say distilled water would be free of fluoride? Does a distillation process get rid of that? Yeah. Yeah. But like you said, then you have to add more minerals back into it. Right. And yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated process to go through. Yeah. Do you have anything? The reverse, the reverse osmosis can reduce fluoride. It's not going to remove it completely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you have any more um, tips, Brenda, around eliminating or minimizing fluoride from our diets? Um, there is a little fluoride meter you can buy on Amazon and then you have to buy a re a standard to use to calibrate it, like a, a solution of one milligram per liter of fluoride, just so you know your meter is calibrated correctly and you can test your own water then. And the meter is like maybe 300 bucks or 200 and some dollars now. Um, I even would collect a lot of urine I made all the guys that I work with, like, give me a urine sample uh, a couple years ago before I worked at the place I'm working now. And like some of their urine would have so much fluoride in it. And I would be like, oh, my God, are you drinking tea or something? And they're like, yeah, this is what I'm drinking. And I'm like, well, let me test what you're drinking and then your pee. So like I, I did this whole thing in the lab at work of my old job. <laughs> Of like testing everybody's drinks and their their pee. Give me a pee sample. <laughs> well, that's kind of interesting for people to, you know, if they want to know how much is in their body. So I was watching one of your old videos on uh, frequencies and I have really bad asthma and I was measuring my urine and I kept having high levels of fluoride. I was like, why do I, where is this coming from? Because I'm trying to get rid of fluoride in my water and foods and all this stuff. It's in processed chicken too. It's very high. And I'm like, where is this coming from? It was my asthma medication. So I cut out my asthma medication. I went and got trained in frequency specific microcurrents. So now I just hook up electrodes and I do an asthma protocol. And I have asthma maybe a couple times a year now. And instead I, I needed that inhaler every single day, multiple times per day. And my doctor wanted to put me on adverb, but it gave me these sores in my mouth and I didn't like that. So I learned the frequencies and then my fluoride, my fluoride went down in my urine. So it must have been the asthma medication that was making it go up. So that's one of the best things is just buy a cheap meter and then you can test your own urine to see how much you're, you're, you know, given off. But the thing is like children, their kidneys don't function like ours. So they retain more of the urine instead of urinating it out. They retain more of the fluoride than urinating and out. And then also like elderly people, a lot of times they don't have the right kidney function or the optimal kidney function anymore either. So they retain more fluoride too. And then and, and that's another thing about retaining it. You know, um, about 50% of the fluoride that a healthy adult consumes is retained in their body, mostly in their bones. And I forget what the half-life, I think the half-life is like 20 years or something for fluoride. So when you get to be older, your bones have a lot of fluoride in it. And, and, and this is another thing when the doctor, the dentist said, oh, make your teeth harder. If I were to carry two bowls out onto my stone patio, one's a wooden bowl, bowl and one is a ceramic bowl, and I was to trip over a cat or something, and drop both bowls. Well, the ceramic bowl is harder than the wooden bowl. But which one is going to break? 
ceramic bowl is going to shatter. Yeah, and the wind bowl won't. So, you know, the, the fluoride. Oh, it makes your teeth harder. Yeah, kind of it does. But that tooth is more likely to shatter. And it's being sequestered in our bones. And as you get older, these bones become more brittle. And they are filled with fluoride because you've been drinking fluoride for decades and the stuff you drank 20 years ago is still in you right. and it's an inflammatory it is an inflammatory drug and so it's causing you know the arthritis i have bone spurs on every one of my vertebrae every one of them so i'm not as agile as i used to be and that is a symptom of skeletal fluorosis we don't have that in the United States. The doctor says, well, some people get these. We don't know why. I know why. I know why. Well, skeletal fluorosis is, I mean, there's studies showing um, like ur rural communities in Africa and I think Iran, they're having major issues because of the natural fluoride in the water is creating skeletal fluorosis and crippling and all these things. So they do kind of know that's yep. but not American doctors. Right. They don't American do doesn't. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, you were talking about calcium fluoride versus um phosphoric acid earlier. Um, India, where they have a lot of boreholes, that's where they get the fluoride. It's not on, in the surface water so much as it is in the boreholes and kind of deep in the earth. Um, the remedy that they 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 um, prescribe to these people who are suffering from fluoride poisoning is high calcium get a lot of calcium and magnesium in you and that helps you not to be symptomatic it was interesting when i was so sick you know in the beginning i was trying to figure out what it is i discovered that a powdered calcium and magnesium did, um, uh, supplement made me feel a lot better and so when i was taking that that made me feel a lot better. it didn't make me all better but it made me feel a lot better i said oh this is really making a difference in my life and now i know why because it was somewhat protecting me from the fluoride that I was consuming from my filtered water. And yeah, that's great to know. So calcium. Now, this isn't something that's, you know, mandated by the federal government in the US. This is something our local communities decide based on the EPA accepted, okay amount to put in water, and then the CDC promotes it all. So we can take actual steps in our own community. So what would be some action steps that you would recommend if those listening would want to take some steps in the local communities to get fluoride removed from their local water? Well, the first thing you need to do is look at your state law because the Safe Drinking Water Act says that the government cannot mandate anything put in the water to treat people. But they kind of allow the states and the municipalities to do it. So the state law is going to tell you a lot. So you think he's just going to go talk to City Hall or the Board of Health. That doesn't work. You got to start by looking at your state law and really understanding what the state law means. And Massachusetts is different than Wisconsin or California or Arkansas or New Jersey or any other state. So um, you've got to know that. The second thing you've got to know is that Health and Human Services has, I understand, to have a hundred million dollar plus budget to promote fluoridation. They are the boss of the state departments of public health. So the state departments of public health get money to promote fluoridation from health and human services. The local boards of health are the operating arm of the state departments of public health. So even though the federal, no, no agency in the federal government can mandate this, they can promote it all the way down to your local communities. So I don't like to waste time with the Board of Health because they are the operating arm of, you know, basically health and human services. And they're in between a rock and a hard place. And they'll, they'll want to say safe and accept, accepted, safe and effective and all this other garbage. So then you have to figure it out on a state level. I know that some people down in Kentucky where there is a stand state mandate are doing a good job working with their state legislators. But the American Dental Association, which by the way, is not a patient oriented association. They are a consumer, a, a members 
associations. So they work for the benefit of the dentists, not for the patients. So they have a lot of money. They've been said to um, rival the NRA in their power. So they, they're, they're doing a heck of a lot. I've had people tell me that they thought they had the state legislators all on their side and they walked in and they weren't looking at them and they had been got to, that people had told them, we will work to get you out of office if you let this go through. So nobody has the winning idea yet. Uh, a friend of us, Clint Brees, I'm going to give him a plug. He wrote a book recently, um, Something in the Water, um, about how to organize and try to do this. Um, but nobody has the magic solution yet. I have my concepts for what I'm trying to do here in Massachusetts. And Brenda's doing what she wants to do in, 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 in her state. But it's different. Now, you're in, are you in California, Christy? No, I fled California. I'm now in Arizona. You know, now so. well, California. I'm going to mention California. California did manage to get a state mandate put through in the in the in the dark of the night, and they were patting themselves in the back for doing that. And a lot of communities are saying we don't want to do it, and they and the, and their, their city councilors or city um, lawyers were telling them they had to do it. But a few towns in California, I think Santa Barbara is the most notable and the largest, had told told them, no, no way, we're not going to do it. And the state law has no teeth to it. So they're not doing it, even though they're mandated to do it. So like I said, you really have to find out. In Arkansas, they're mandated to do it. And shout out to Andy Anderson and his group. They are saying, no, we're not going to put poison in the water. We know this is bad. We love our environment. We're not going to do it. And they're being fined. They're being fined every day, and they're fighting it. We are not going to spend the money. We're not going to put in the infrastructure. We'll pay your fines if we must, but we're not going to put poison in the water. So in, in, in Maine, just north of me, you can vote it out by referendum. You can't do that in Massachusetts. But the water workers in the Kennebunkport district, which is the second largest water district in Maine, they led the charge and they did a lot of education and they had a lot of people in the community on their side. And they also had some big, big mucky mucks with the American Dental Association in the, living in that community too, but they voted it out of the water. So getting it out of the water is going to differ from state to state. <laughs> so even if your lawsuit with the current EPA, will, will that affect all the states or do do we still need to go state to state after that? How does that work? I'll let Brenda take the first crack at that answer. So our lawsuit cannot technically ban water fluoridation. It's going to make EPA do a proper risk assessment on it, which will lead to the ban of it because there is no safe level. Because they and said they set the standards, basically, or saying the safety standards. They yeah, set the sure. maximum contaminant level and the maximum contaminant level goal, but the goal is not enforceable. Only the MCL is enforceable. But they were recommended to lower that MCL in 2006 by the NRC Council, and they've done nothing. But they're going to have to do the proper risk assessment, which is what NTP just did. Um, so it should end it because NTP said, hey, the best evidence is at 1.5, which the World Health Organization has 1.5 milligrams per liter as their limit. So if we know that that is the harmful level, then EPA sets a safety factor or uncertainty factor for chemicals that are neurotoxic. And so you have to divide that number by 10. They usually use 10. So that would make 0.15 the level that's safe. So Ideally, they would set their MCL at 1.5. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But it will control the whole country. Um, then you wouldn't have to go to your state. But that might take 20 years. It might take 30 years. So it's best that as soon as that NTP report is finalized, which I'm sure a lot of fluoride promoters are watching this video right now, and that's why they have fought so hard to not let that report get published as a final document because they know people like me are going to take it and say, hey, look, and my you know state epidemiologist is already educated on this. They've read the draft reports already from 
2019 and 2020. So that's one way that you can try to force your way in to get it done. But the thing is like getting fluoride out of the water is a full-time job. Like you have to educate yourself. You need to find like-minded people to back you up. You need to educate doctors and get them on your side. You need to find chiropractors, medical doctors, pediatricians, other dentists that aren't using it in their practice. A lot of people are using silver hydroxy appetite now because that is a little safer than the fluoride that they're all using. So it's, it's basically your, you have to be an educator and just dedicate yourself to educating people and not really, you can't go into a meeting thinking, Oh, today's the day I'm going to get fluoride out of the water. Cause that's not going to happen. So you have to think of it as today's the day I'm going to educate someone that didn't know anything about fluoride, or I'm going to educate even the promoters. Like there's so much the promoters spew out of their mouth that is just completely wrong. Like they don't know how many cavities, 25%. Tooth decay is reduced by 25%. Well, how many cavities is that? It's debated whether it's like a half a cavity, one full cavity. Is it really worth it drinking fluoride for 30 or 40 years to reduce it, your tooth decay by 25%, which equals a half a cavity for permanent brain damage? So, yeah. yeah. You know, that 25% number came from a study done by um, um, Jay Kumar in Newburgh and Kingston back in the 1980s to see what improvement um, fluoridation had on the kids. So they had a pool of 1,500 kids and grades one through five in the two communities. There was no difference in cavities in the fifth graders. There were no differences in the fourth graders or the third graders or the second graders. When you got down to the first grade, in the lowest social economic group, all right, there were an average of two cavities in the non-fluoridated community and one and a half cavities in the fluoridated community. The difference between two cavities and one and a half is 25%. Now, this (laughs) out of a subgroup of maybe 20 or 30 kids, out of 1,500. And so what are the headlines? It reduces cavities by 25% in, in, in the poor, poorest children. What the heck? You and have you one, one kid in this group who went to sleep with a, with a lollipop in his mouth could have skewed that. You know, this, 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 and this, like I said, I'm an analyst. I read the studies and it was, it was really the pro-fluoride article. Oh dear, I'm losing my battery here. It was really the um, pro-fluoride articles and studies that turned me into an activist. And that and the trolls. Because I could tell that the fix was in. They, They were saying things that were just totally inappropriate. Yeah, it's this tricky math, I always call it, that that a lot of, when you use percentages, it can be very deceptive either way. You can say, oh, this, you know, medicine, you know, only harms 1% of people, but 1% of people is like 5 million people. <laughs> you know, you, oh, it's, it's just tricky. It, percentages are tricky and it's a great way to hide things and you, you can do a lot of tricky things with math, so... You can, but what I would what, to, to finish up what Brenda was saying, don't depend on this study. You have to act now. You have to educate people and you have to take whatever is coming out from the NTP, from the Tosco trial, whatever. And you need to educate your politicians and figure out in your state where, where do you have the leverage to make a difference, whether it's, you know, the water commissions or the, wherever. You figure it out. But to use what's coming out every day, every week, every month, every year, because it's not going to magically different disappear. These people are not going to go out down without a fight. Fluoridation promotion is a big business as well. A lot of money is being involved here. And the fluoride polluters, as we mentioned before, are not going to want to see this happen. So we've got some big, big, big enemies against us in this battle. You want to add to that, Brenda? About I just wanted to add earlier about the the tooth decay that 
when you're exposed to fluoride, your teeth don't erupt in your mouth as soon as normal. So that may be a false, they didn't control for that with the studies. Right. So if your teeth aren't in your mouth for as long, you're not going to have as much risk of tooth decay as if your teeth came were longer in your mouth. Do you know what I'm saying? Basically, when you're a child, it delays like the growth of your tooth. Yes. It's, it's a it, thyroid. It, it just interferes with your thyroid hormones, which results in the teeth evo- erupting later. And they noticed that right from the beginning in the 1940s, the teeth were erupting later in the fluoridated communities. Exactly. And, and the girls were having their periods younger. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Now, for your lawsuit, what are the next major dates um, coming up for listeners who'd like to, you know, check it out or help support, et cetera? Um, what, what, what's coming up? April 11th at 2.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's all over Zoom. If you go to fluoridelawsuit.com, it's right on the homepage, all the Zoom links, everything to get into the meeting. Also, it's good to check. There's a link there to double check with the Judge Chen's docket to make sure, because sometimes he'll like push it back a couple days or a month. So just double check. But I try to keep that updated as much as possible. If people have some extra funds they want to throw towards our lawsuit, fluoridealert.org. If you go to their page right on the top, there's a donate button on the upper left-hand side. You can donate money. Um, Just share it. Share it with everyone you know. Constantly be plugging in on social media. But the April 11th is the big date that the judge is going to be setting a trial. We're going to go back to another trial. We had our first trial in 2020. It lasted about two weeks. Now we're going to have another trial based on the NTP report and those who have tried to suppress it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and we're going to, you you both are going to provide me with a lot of other links and resources that we will post below. I'll post all those links below as, as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. And sharing such great information. This is just vital. All Americans are aware of what's going on. And thank you both for all this extensive research and putting your time and life into, you know, really, you know, advocating for all our, you know, quality of health here in the US. Um, And thank you for standing up against Big Gov as well. Um, That's definitely, you're definitely taking on a lot. So thank you. Before we wrap it up, do each of you have any final thoughts or words to share on fluoride or the Florida program here in the US. Just, I want to say thank you so much for having us on. We could go on and on and on forever about fluoride because we know so much. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I second that. I think Brenda and I share, um, as single mothers, we share values of, of, of um, honesty and empathy. And that's why we're both so involved in this. And we are just feeling both just so incensed at the betrayal on the part of the CDC and others in government who have um, just acted in manipulative and immoral manners that have, you know, really ruined um, the health of so many of us. And um, we appreciate the opportunity to get that message out. And we hope everyone does check out the websites and go into their state government and figure out what the laws are and do whatever is necessary because we are being poisoned every day with Shanghai smog and, and scrubber liquor waste from phosphate industry. And that is not right. Remember knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And if you like this video, please like, and share with others. This information could really help somebody may know If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our future shows. And I will see you all next Wednesday on the next episode of Discovering True Health.